When the oil stops, everything stops, nothing left in the fountain. Nobody wants paper money, son, you just best stop counting. Can you break the horse, light the fire, sad I beg your pardon. You best start thinking where your food comes from, and I hope you tend a good garden. Getting down on the mountain, getting down on the mountain. Do want to be around when the shit goes down, I'll be getting down on the mountain. Getting down on the mountain. So let's talk about starting your cold climate food forest. Now where I live is one of the, well it's very inhospitable. So we have frost up until June and then frost again starts in September. And from September to June, it's, uh, yeah, freezing outside. So we have a very short window to grow stuff. So it's kind of difficult. Uh, places like Alaska on the coast are easier. Uh, it's easier weather with the ocean. Here in the center part of Canada, it gets absolutely grossly cold. Uh, the conditions are worse than Alaska. So... In this short amount of time, we have to get quite a bit of uh, produce, as much as we can. So, apples, uh, I think I've got 32 apple trees and 12 different varieties in the uh, food forest here. Apples are the best where I live because you can harvest them quickly. A lot of apples in a short amount of time, right? It's a large fruit. You pick it, then an apple in the cooler will last a long, long time. The apple is the most versatile of the fruits uh, for making apple juice, apple sauce, eating fresh apples. Uh, you get a lot of food for a minimal amount of picking and it lasts a long time. So this would be our oldest apple tree. It's six or seven years old. This is a parkland apple. And most people think that uh, we can't grow like full-size grocery store apples in, well, Saskatchewan. We can. Uh, people are used to tartar crab apples type of thing. But these are all developed at the U of S. In, or, some, or some of these are developed at the University of Saskatchewan. So this would be a autumn delight, I believe. Prairie Sensation. I think it's Autumn Gold it's called. Uh, Prairie Rose or Misty Rose. Another apple. So in between the apple trees are different types of lower growing perennials that we get. So we have rhubarb there. These are walking onions, a patch of those. These are chives. I've got to clean all this up yet. This spring. And another spot here, I think there's just some perennial flowers in this one. I've got to replant this because picking some weeds, just some grass clumps. And this one, I got to pick all that grass out, but we have, uh, uh, what is it, chamomile for tea, a domestic uh, chamomile, and it spreads. But, uh, so we uh, proper spacing on the apples. And for those that are professional for pruning and stuff, I've got some work to do uh, just behind. And, well, I probably won't even get to it this year, but for pruning. But what I did with my irrigation, because we're starting, when you start a food forest, I mean, somebody that hasn't done it thinks you can just plant stuff and it'll just permaculture, it'll naturally do it, you don't have to water. No, no, you have to be hands-on, it's a lot of work. So I have trunk lines for all my rows of fruit trees with a valve 
and I put these straw bales, I had some extra old straw bales, um, I put them on the north side because when we started like the Saskatoon, it was just a six inch tall stick, maybe three or, or four years ago for these I think. But this is different types of domestic Saskatoon berries. So those bales, eventually I can just break them apart and uh, uh, spread it out as for mulch. Or I think, no, actually these are plums, I'm sorry. These, these guys are plum trees. This is the uh, domestic Saskatoon berry. So, and then a spot for something else that didn't make it, because lots of stuff doesn't make it. A little tiny Saskatoon berry right there. Another one. I got the drip line going. Another one in Saskatoon. Space for something else. This is what a, our apple trees look like when you start them. Super tiny. That is a Evans cherry. It's not a my favorite for eating, but we do have one Evans. Another fruit tree. Did you know that we can grow hazelnuts in Saskatchewan? That's a hazelnut tree. That's about four years old, so it's taking its sweet time. Rhubarb in that roll, row. This pear didn't make it. This was a, uh, probably was gr greenhouse grown, wasn't weathered. So that's getting pulled. Uh, this is choke cherries. Three kinds of choke cherries. Uh, in here we mulched and we just started our perennial asparagus patch for one of them. In there we have room for in this clump in between the choke cherries. So again with permaculture you have higher growing trees and try to make use of the space. Um, by growing other perennials underneath. Apple tree. Hi Daisy. Another apple tree. Did you know that we can grow pears in the middle of Canada? So we just have a, uh, what do we have? Well, maybe just one pear tree right now. Uh, this guy, but pears don't last as long. So when you pick the pears, you have to do something with them. That's why I prefer apples for everything. So only one pear tree. This is a plum. Another plum. So I don't like using plastic, but I ended up... Well, I, I shouldn't say that I like using plastic. It's not the greatest, but it, to keep the weeds down in such huge areas, uh, putting this plastic mulch down is key almost. But these are uh, different varieties of hascaps in each one of these rows. So these ones are two or three years old. And these bigger ones are four or five years old. Hascaps you want to put in kind of hedge rows so you can put a net on them or else the birds will eat every single berry. Threw a plum in there. These are currants. I think this one's a black currant and there's some red currants in here. They're great for jam and fresh eating actually. Did you know that we can grow apricots in Saskatchewan? We haven't got an apricot yet, but these trees are surviving and doing amazing. I've got room in this plastic mulch to put something else to start. Uh, in this one is 250 strawberries I put uh, three days ago. So nice little rows in there. Raspberries. huge row of raspberries. So we bought raspberries off somebody local and planted them and a couple years go by, they kind of get settled in and now they're suckering everywhere. 
and throwing out those guys. So we could be thinning these out already. We're gonna have a crazy amount of raspberries this year. And it's about going from scarcity to abundance. So now that these are established, they're just gonna spread out of this one little patch. You know, I could thin them out and do four other patches and just keep uh, spreading like that. The same goes for all, all this other stuff. We can propagate, take cuttings off of currants and well, everything really, and just keep expanding, planting, planting. This is kind of cool. This, I tried to make like a little sheltered area with a climber thing. I couldn't keep grapes alive out here. We had uh, grapes here mostly, but I planted three kiwis, and they're a different type of kiwi. They're smaller, you eat them with the skin on. Two died. But in the shelter of this just uh, volunteer tree and this one and the bales on the back, a kiwi survived. So this is actually going to produce us kiwis in Saskatchewan. So don't mind the weeds everywhere, of course. Uh, we don't really use sprays. So it's something we just have to deal with. My rows are big enough. I can get the little tractor in with a, a harrow. You don't want to till wood chips in uh, as that will rob the soil of nutrients. Wood chips, you just want to keep adding. But I will do the top layer as the weeds get out of hand with a tine harrow usually just to kind of rip the weeds off. But... This is the our oldest has caps type of thing. Has caps are the first berry. Uh, they'll be ready shortly here in June. That's the first fruit that we can get outside in Saskatchewan. Different uh, varieties of them in here. And again, I should actually have a net on these already right now because the birds are, they know they're here and they will eat every single one of them. Everything's happy in the wood chips. Holds in moisture, but we still do water. It's been drought the last three years, I guess. Plums. I believe it's called Ivanhoe and Petitsen or something. Plums. These are probably planted a little too close together. That little guy is going to make it, I think. Just got to keep them wet. And sour cherries. So uh, there's different types of sour cherries. I think this is, these are from the U of S as well, but they're the uh, romance series. I find them a little nicer tasting. But uh, in cold climates, it seems that sour fruit is what does best here. So, uh, for whatever reason. So a smaller fruit and sour. It's a different type of cherry cutting I got from somebody and it's going to survive actually. Perfect. Just planted that two weeks ago. So again, weeds is something you just have to deal with unless you're going to be spraying every couple of weeks. Just a hardy mac. I think this was, I think this deal was off of, uh, at Canadian Tire. Uh, actually, no, this is a multi uh, c combination apple. Look at that, cool. Sometimes they go on sale and they actually survive, like they're cold hardy plants. 
So pretty excited. Hardy Mac is like my favorite apple. I don't have any in this orchard. I got some on the other other side. Um, but Hardy Macs, they're huge. All these apples are huge and delicious. So, wood chips. Uh, so I've hauled close to 10,000 cubic yards of wood chips, or I haven't hauled that. Some tree trimming services hauled the majority of that for free. We put ads out and we're close enough to the tree trimming services that they'd bring them out when they needed to get rid of them. But uh, I've hauled probably 4,000 yards myself. I did a couple spurts there, a whole week of hauling with a 15-yard uh, dump trailer. So wood chips, I put them down and we, we have terrible soil. It's heavy clay and rock. So I just kept layering it and you put the wood chips down and it's like the wood chips disappear. They turn into the best soil you could possibly imagine. And then you put more wood chips on top and then it a little bit slower starts turning into soil. And then you put more on and it takes a, quite a while for the top layer to break down. And eventually the soil gets so rich that each time you add mulch on top, it doesn't have to feed the soil as much. So uh, it's just time you keep layering and layering and adding. Eventually your soil gets so rich that the top layer kind of stays dry and doesn't compost. So in here we've got some, that's a current. Little tiny apple. Current. Perennial flowers. I've still got to mulch this soil. I hate having exposed soil. Apple. Current. So in this bed, I kind of alternated uh, apples and currants, it looks like. And then we've got perennial bulbs the wife put in, in and around them. So the low growing stuff and then the high growing stuff together, works together. But a whole bunch of drip lines for starting these little guys because it's a ridiculous amount of work trying to hand water and keep everybody watered. So I've got valves and zones on this uh, <coughs> three quarter acre food forest. So eventually, fast forward another five years, 10 years, my curved paths, Apple trees don't get huge or nothing, but some Saskatoons will. But it's going to be like an archway to go through. And everything kind of partially shaded, keeps everything a little more moist. Things growing in between and around the fruit trees. And this awesome walking path in between them. So it looks like a big path, but you have to think for the future like how big some of these trees are going to get. Um, so you have to leave space for it. But I did kind of curved paths. I just worked with with nature. Uh, kind of, that's how it worked out. But curved paths as well. The wind won't have a direct shot through. Once everything's big, it's all kind of works together and shelters itself. Now here's some uh, tips for you. Uh, if well, if you're in the city, the city is like a an milder climate. It's like a microclimate. You're protected by other houses, and it's heated up by asphalt and things like that. So in a cold climate, like in a windy spot where we live, that is. Uh, a bonus. So this this per little food forest is about three quarters of an acre, but it's exposed to the wind and the elements. It's colder. <coughs> so 
for example, if you planted this hascap the same time we did in the city, it would probably be twice the size by now. Same with the cherries, the plums, the apricots, everything would be bigger. But in the city, you don't exactly have three quarters of an acre to do all this stuff. So we've planted 7,000 additional trees that are taking their sweet time around to make our microclimate because we're in the open in the prairie it gets windy it gets colder more tolerant to or more risk of frost out in the open but eventually as all this just grows up as i look after it you don't have to do anything you don't have to water it becomes more sheltered and it just works everything grows up together the shelter the fruit trees everything so not far from the food forest is different water sources so we have our really good well and then the the pond and it does have standing water so i can pull water from there And again, if you're in a development or something, uh, they don't allow you to dig a well in certain ones. So of course, with the, being a farm, we can dig wells. So we have uh, unlimited water and all it, no water bill, it just is the electricity to pump it essentially. So like for example, if you buy a, outdoor above ground swimming pool or something it's probably six or eight hundred dollars to fill it up whereas out here well the last three years we have water going 24 7 sprinklers here's another dirt dirt garden We're gonna have to put our honeybee hive uh, in this orchard system. I've got them a little ways away because we started that before we did the fruit tree system. But uh, instead of the bees having to travel such a long way, we can have them closer now. In and around the house, more apples. More currants, either black or red, I forget. Currants, currants. Hardy Mac apple tree next to the house. That's my favorite apple. Another apple. I planted these willows too close to my poor little apple here. So I've been pruning and taking cuttings off of these willows to hollow out a space, kind of microclimate for this apple. But uh, don't forget to use the proper spacing. But uh, these apples are doing amazing as well. You can also kind of see the sloping land. It's just a gradual slope down to the water, but there's kind of a swale-ish system. There's kind of divots and humps. So if it rains a lot, it's going to accumulate a small amount of water. The water won't just rush into uh, back into the body of water. So I hear California has got a water shortage problem. And that's because of traditional farming. It's just exposed dirt farming and asphalt cities. So just picture it rains, the exposed dirt washes away topsoil. The water doesn't go into the soil anymore. And then it hits asphalt and they're big storm drain systems. 
and it eventually goes and turns into salt water in the ocean. So yeah, there's a water shortage in California. No shit. Uh, California is probably inhospitable for humans, even though it's probably one of the nicest climates or should be one of the nicest climates, but when it's exposed dirt and uh, asphalt everywhere, it's no wonder you have a water shortage. So yeah, we spend the majority of our time looking after all this stuff and uh, still the weeds will catch up on us but it's a lot of work a lot of drip lines a lot of watering a lot of babying um, a lot of hauling wood chips but eventually it's gonna get easier as I get older so this will just be a natural permaculture type food forest where once the trees get big enough you don't have to you don't have to water them the roots get established the wood chips are holding in the soil so it doesn't matter the drought if droughts come, they're, uh, they'll just survive. So I picture uh, at some rural elementary schools, the, they, there'd be an old crab apple tree in the playground. In every recess, the kids will be throwing balls at it, picking bark off of it, having apple fights. Nobody waters that, that crab apple tree. Nobody looks after it. It's just old enough and established enough that even in a drought, it just doesn't matter. Kids beating on it, it just produces a whole bunch of apples. And that's just one lone tree out by itself, like next to a kid's playground at an elementary school. So all this, you baby it, have the mulch covering, it should just be abundance in the future.